got the wrong file, sorry. Can you see it now? Can you see the slide? <clears throat> yes, biblical hermeneutics. Okay. All right. This is our 26th lesson. We're actually beginning to use what's called inductive reasoning. And uh, our our principle is if, if we apply, apply induction, we get a likely answer. And so induction is developing something that's likely. However, if you take the universe of information about a particular subject and, and use induction on it and go to all of the things it says about a subject, then you have uh, your you begin your induction becomes deductive, and you now you have a, you have the universal truth on the matter. So the Bible is the complete will of God. That's why uh, it's important that the church and the, the audience that you're preaching or teaching preaching to or teaching understands the Bible is the complete will of God, and the completeness of the Bible is important for that reason. So whenever we reason from the Bible and get all it says on a particular subject, then we have uh, we have taken care of that matter. Any questions? That is, we we're reasoning deductively. Uh, this is our 26th lesson. We're considering all the Bible says on a particular subject. Let's apply induction. That is, we put together the facts, and if we take all the Bible says on a particular subject, then uh, we can we can know all that God wants us to know for our salvation, and that's that's the point we want to make here. Uh, the Bible doesn't answer all the questions we might want to have answers to, but it does answer the pertinent questions that are related to salvation. Now, I'm not going to give you, a, uh, I won't go into the passage, but John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31 shows that. There were many other things that were written that happened in the, in the other signs that therefore did Jesus the presence of a disciple was not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe, and they believe you may have life in his name. So they have enough evidence to prove enough to get, get us uh, into a state of salvation, to, to be saved, to have life. So that's important that we keep that in mind in the back of our mind here, what we're doing. We're going to look at the mob that came to take Jesus, and here are the passages, these four passages, giving the accounts of this incident. Other passages, we'll, we'll take some other passages as peripheral points on this subject, and we, when we get through, we're going to know all that God wants us to know or that we need to know for our salvation on this particular subject. And so we'll be putting all these together and we'll pro provide some information from these passages. Cutting off of the high priest's servant's ear serves as a good example of these principles. In Mark 6, 14, 47, we see, but a certain one of them that stood by and drew his sword and smote the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. So right here we see a certain one of them that stood by and drew his sword. Now let me point out that the Greek word is translated certain, usually in the case someone prominent, uh, particularly in the context. So this is not just somebody, it's somebody prominent. Most likely, that's how it's used. And they're, they're right there when this mob comes to take Jesus. Of course, he draws the sword and he smote the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. So now what we have here, we have some information. We have Mark gives a brief account. One of them that stood by, a certain one, drew his sword. We, we don't uh, uh, have the name of the of the servant of the high priest. We don't have, I don't know which ear he cut off. Okay, we don't know his name. So we can check the facts if this is all we have. 
but we got information here. And so you get this brief account. One who drew his sword and smote the servant high priest is called a certain one. The Greek word is tis. It's an indefinite pronoun in clinic. That means the uh, accent mark drops off. That's all that means. It's used uh, whenever it's put in, in, the, in the text. And so the accent gets moved to the word before it or it drops off one or the other. It's used of persons and things concerning which the writer either cannot or will not speak more particularly. Someone he doesn't want to talk about more fully. The expression certain one usually refers to one who is prominent if we look at it. And so that that's how it's used. Uh, when I lectured in Russia, they spoke to me in English and they had studied the teachers that were teaching English would uh, speak to me and they'd use that certain one at that certain place and they're talking about some, something prominent. And that's how they used it and they learned their English in England. And I think probably that, uh, that, that that's used more in England than in the United States. So, but that is correct English, however. Matthew, if we go to Matthew, we can get a little more information. We get two additional things. Let's read Matthew's account of this in Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of them that were with Jesus. Now, this gives us more information. Let's go back. See right here. In this passage, this certain uh, one that stood by. We don't know from this whether this person from Mark's account, whether the one that struck, drew the sword uh, was with the mob and just swinging his sword around, cut the guy's ear off, or we don't know if he was with Jesus, or maybe he was just someone standing by. We don't know whether he's with Jesus, with the mob, or just, just uh, someone standing by. So if all we had is Mark account, we can't answer those questions. Right. Back now, this tells us, Behold, one of them that were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and smote the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. So now we learn now that the one that cut the man's ear off was with Jesus and he drew his sword. So we learn another piece of information. It wasn't someone just standing by or it wasn't one of the, one of the people with the mob. It was one with Jesus. But we learned something else that Mark didn't tell us. Now, Mark didn't tell us this, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. There's a logical fallacy involved in claiming that there's an error in the contradiction. So uh, when we get into the logic class, we can look at, look at that if you need to. But right here, the verse 52 goes on and says, Then saith Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So Jesus rebuked the one who drew the sword and smote off the servant of the high priest here. All right. So now we know that the per person was with Jesus and Jesus rebuked him. <clears throat> Any questions? All right. If we go further in this, Matthew. When we take Matthew's accounts, <coughs> a certain one was with Jesus, not with the mob. And we learn that Jesus rebuked him for his action. Now then, let's go to Luke's account now. When that they that were about him saw what would follow. So those that were with Jesus saw what was following, that mob was about to come and take him. They said, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? So not just the one who drew the sword, but others were saying, shall we smite with the sword? So they're asking Jesus, they plural ask, shall we smite with the sword? Not just this one particular one who did the cutting off the high priest servants here, but the others were ready to fight also. <clears throat> but Jesus answered and said, Suffer you them thus far, and he touched his ear and healed him. So now, and a certain one, I'm sorry, let's skip verse 50. And a certain one of them had smote the servant of the high priest and struck off his right ear. Now it's his right ear. 
So we see now it's the right ear that's cut off and we know which ear got cut off. But Jesus answered and said, suffer you them thus far, and he touched his ear and healed him. So now we see two more things, or three more things here. First of all, we see that they asked Jesus if they should use the sword to fight, and a certain one of them then smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus then said, suffer them thus far, and Jesus healed him. But we know from our other account that Jesus rebuked him for doing that, this one. And they asked Jesus if they should fight. Now they, not just the one who wielded the sword, the right ear was cut off and the Lord healed the man and said, suffer them, permit them to take me. That's what he's saying. Now then we have one more account of this, what I call the fourfold gospel, not the four gospels, I call it the fourfold gospel, because it's the same message and just a little bit of different accounts of it or different pieces of information put together. So there's only one gospel. In John 18, 10 and 11, John gives some more information. Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it and struck the servants, high priest servant, cut off his right ear. Now, this certain prominent one that, that uh, cut the man's ear off was Simon Peter. So now we see some more information. We were asking, we were wondering who it was. Now we find out it's Simon Peter. And he cut off his right ear, the ser high priest servant, and cut off his right ear. Now, the servant's name was Malchus, so those people of that time could go find Malchus and ask if this really happened. I don't know, but what Malchus might have obeyed the gospel, we just don't know. I hope he did. He may have. If he did, then he served as a witness to this. But nonetheless, he could be asked if his ear was cut off, and uh, so people could go to him and ask him. So now then, we know the servant's name. It was his right ear. We know who did it. Peter did it. Jesus therefore said unto Peter, put the sword in the sheath, the cup which the Father gave me shall not drink it. So now Jesus rebuked Peter. And so now we, when we put this together, we get some more information. The certain one who was with Jesus was Peter, who drew the sword and cut off the right ear of the servant. Service name was Malchus. Now, what we know from induction now is this. We know that Peter and the others the disciples asked the Lord if they should fight. Now, that's important. We're going to show the importance of it, the significance of it as we develop this lesson. Peter drew his sword and cut off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, and we'll see the importance of the right ear. And Malchus, of course, served as a witness. They named him. Whereupon Jesus healed the ear of the servant of Duke Peter for his rash actions. Now, we have any questions at this point? We're not through with this, but we're going to take some more information and add some more to it. Now, we said, they said, Lord, shall we, shall we fight? They asked Jesus. They plural. So this implies that more than one of them was ready to draw a sword out and fight. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. In Luke 22, 38, when the preparation was made, there were two swords. So apparently two of them people had swords and Peter was one of them. Apparently Peter was one of the two who had a sword. And or this use, a kaira, is, uh, is really just like a small knife for cutting animals, like a butcher knife. It's like a, it's probably a big butcher knife is what it was. And uh, so a, a small sword. If you take a, an eight inch long, a 12 inch long butcher knife, you can do some damage with it. Uh, and it becomes like a small sword. The Romans used a small short sword uh, for their battles. And of course, they had a large sword also. 
but uh, this is the smaller sword, maybe maybe 12, 14 inches long, something like that. That's what it was. So this is a large knife used for killing animals. And the word here is used for a cook's knife. And uh, so, or a butcher, our butcher knife and a, and a small sword is used for both. <laughs> Peter was a fisherman. It's possible that he was carrying his butcher knife that he used for cutting up fish. Okay, that's entirely possible that he, he had this with him. That's a possibility. So uh, that that may be it may be that he had a particularly had a sword designed for his use, but I like to think he's probably just had a big butcher knife. Probably may have been 12, 14 inches long. I don't know. But here's what the Roman sword, the gladius, it's about 30 inches long from hill to, to the end of the sword. And so probably got about uh, two foot of cutting. And that's their, that's their battle sword right there, about 30 inches long. Now, let's go to the 18th chapter of John and get some more information. One of the servants of the high priest now, this is when Peter came and was he warming himself by the fire uh, while, during Jesus' trial, the Lord's trial. One of the servants of the high priest, being a kinsman of him who the ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? So this kinsman was there with the mob. Peter therefore denied again straight away the cock crew. So it was a kinsman of Malchus. And so he would have known that the ear got cut off. And of course, the man was healed by Jesus. That ought to have given them a reason to stop their action, but they didn't. They didn't think clearly. Okay, Peter, now then we ask another question. So we see another con con confrontation there between a relative of Malchus and Peter. Furthermore, if we go to and ask ourselves about Peter, if you were facing a mob, you wouldn't turn your back to them, to two groups that are maybe going to get in the fight. So if you're going to do that, you wouldn't turn your back on the person, particularly with a sword, he'd just stab you right in the back, you'd be dead. So Peter was likely, almost certainly was facing the man that he cut his right ear off. Now, if I swing my sword and I'm right-handed, I'll swing it from my body, I'd swing it counterclockwise. My right arm would go in a counterclockwise rotation from my body. And if the man were ducking from it, he's facing me. And if he did, he ducked away from the, the swinging sword. Uh, it would glance off the side of his head and cut off his left ear if I'm right-handed. But if I'm left-handed, I'll be swinging clockwise with my arm. And if he ducked away from it, the swinging sword would cut off his right ear. Right? This would imply that Peter was left-handed. And, and the likelihood that he's left-handed is pretty strong from this. Any comments or questions there? Now, this is going to be significant. We're going to see significance of why it's important if we look at this just in a few minutes. Right. Let's go to Acts 3, 6. Peter's healing a man, and this is a lame man who'd been lame from his birth. And but Peter said, silver and gold have a none. So the, the man there is lying there outside the gate, the beautiful gate. He, uh, he expects some money, and Peter says, I don't have any silver or gold to give you. But what I have, that give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ and Lazarus walk, I got something more important than silver and gold. I'm going to give you your ability to walk. And, and he took him by the right hand. Now, significant. Why does he tell us right hand? Just, why does he just tell us right hand? And he said, took him by the hand. But he said, right hand. He took the time, that the Holy Spirit took the time to tell us it was the right hand that was grasped. Now, if you reach in to pick somebody up and you're right-handed, you'll use your right hand, your master hand, to pull them up. 
If you're left-handed, you use your left hand to pull them up. That's your master arm. Now, if we have this and look at this, then he took him by the right hand. He's facing him. And when I'm facing you, my right hand is to your right to your left, and my it's just opposite your left. And my uh, I'm sorry, my right hand is opposite to your left. And my left hand is opposite to your right. I hope I said that right. But that's what I meant to say. So right here, he he took him by the right hand. So it was Peter's left hand in the right hand of the man he's healing. So now this also implies that uh, Peter was probably left-handed. Raise him up and his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Now you say, why is that important? Because there's a consistency in the Bible. The Bible is consistent with itself. I'll digress just for a moment. But when the Bible says they went up from one place to another, they went up in elevation. They went up. Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple. He's the first child, firstborn. They had to purchase him back, redeem him. That was the law of Moses. And they took him up and it was circumcised also. But whenever he's taken up, redeemed, they went from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and it says they went up. But most of Bethlehem is above Jerusalem in altitude except, except the temple. The temple is higher than any part of Bethlehem. And they took him to the temple. And so they went up, and it's only about 25 feet higher at the Temple Mount than it is in the highest part of Bethlehem. And they're about 12, 14 miles apart. But you see, the Bible said they went up. And when the Bible says they went up, they went up. When it went, said they went down, they went down. Now, in Oklahoma, uh, our way of using prepositions is up is north, that's down is south, out is west, over is east. That's how we use our prepositions. Any questions? But the Bible, when it says it went up, it went up in altitude. Even if it's just 15 or 20 feet difference and about 12, 14 miles apart. So the Bible is always right in this. In this small detail here, we see both of these are consistent with one another for, G, for Peter being left-handed. Both of them fit the idea that, he, that he's probably left-handed. There's no inconsistency here in it. I'm not guaranteeing you that Peter was left-handed, but it would be consistent. These two passages would be consistent with one another if he were left-handed. Any questions? Comments? Here's the left arm lift him up. The lame man was facing Peter. When Peter addressed him, his right hand would be on Peter's left side, as I've already pointed out. So we see how the Bible harmonizes with that, even in small details, it's consistent with itself. Now, get back to the apostles. And they're called disciples most of the time before Acts 2. But there's two kinds of disciples of Christ. There were disciple, uh, apostles of Christ, I'm sorry. There were apostles under the limited commission, Matthew 10. And then there were apostles under the great commission, Acts 2 and thereafter. And Judas Iscariot was an apostle under the limited commission, but not under the great commission. Matthias took his place. All the other 11 apostles were, were apostles under the Revited Commission and the Great Commission. Now then there's an additional apostle of Christ would be Saul of Tarsus and became Paul. So these apostles are disciples view of the nation of the kingdom of heaven. Let's see what their view was. Remember, they asked him if they should fight. Jesus responded to Pilate. When Pilate questions him, and let's read John 18, 35 through 36, and Jesus how responded to Pilate how a carnal kingdom would defend itself. 
this misconception of the nature of the kingdom of God was also evident in their words of Acts 1, 6 or 8, 6 or 7. So let's look at these passages. This is the view of premillennial teachers today. Jesus returning and leading an army against enemies, his enemies, secular carnal army. In Matt, in John 18:35, when Jesus responds, um, Pilate responds to Jesus, "Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? What have you done? I want to know what I, I need to be charging you with. I, I don't really know. What have you done to cause him to do this?" But Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, that's an answer to the question. Why was Jesus delivered up? Because he did not come with a carnal kingdom. His kingdom was a spiritual kingdom, and they didn't want that. If you go back to John 6, you'll see that they, many of the disciples deserted him when they saw it was not a carnal kingdom. They wanted to come and take him by force and make him king. He had grouped them when he fed them at the two, two feedings, uh, and uh, he, he grouped them in groups of 50s and 100s. That's how you group an army. And so these men probably had swords, and they were ready to go to battle. They saw Jesus as a great miracle worker and even greater than Joshua. And the way named Jesus is Joshua. It's the same name. And so all of this fit in with their thinking of a carnal kingdom. And so the disciples here, whenever Jesus says this, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he says here, and I've underlined it. It's not underlined in the text of the Bible. I've added that to it. If my kingdom were of this world, if it were, then would my servants fight? Then I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate's asking him, are you fomenting rebellion against the Roman government? And Jesus said, no, I'm not. Why? Because my kingdom is not a physical kingdom. It's not a kingdom of this world. And Pilate understood it. Pilate then pronounced there's no, no, nothing wrong with him. He hadn't done anything wrong. So right here, the Jesus responded how a carnal kingdom would defend itself. It would defend itself with swords and fight, right? They, they stand up and fight. That's exactly what the servants of a carnal kingdom would do. One of this world, they'd fight to keep from having their king delivered to the Jews. Well, since the disciples tried to fight to keep Jews from delivered to, being delivered to the Jews, the disciples viewed the kingdom as one of this world. They still had the wrong concept of the kingdom. And how do we know that's true? Go to Acts 1 and see it. They, therefore, when they were come together, asked him, saying, Lord, dost thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons, which the Father has set within his own authority. And he goes on and gives them more information. And by the time they began to preaching, be, begin preaching as their guidance, they finally realized the kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. Questions or comments? Well, you can glean a lot of this information from these facts. Even the apostles had this carnal kingdom in Acts 1, 6 or 7. The spiritual nature of the kingdom is evident from the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the apostles did not understand all of the teaching of Jesus until later. John 16, 12. Jesus said to his disciples, and this is the 12, uh, actually this is just 11 because Judas is gone. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And let me digress a moment. The, the 12 is, a, is like a formula. Even though Judas wasn't there, they're still called the 12 because Matthias is going to take his place. Albeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all truth. I have got many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You're not strong enough. You don't understand them. One of these things probably was that the kingdom is spiritual, not physical. 
He says, I'll be when he, the spirit of truth, has come. That's the Holy Spirit. He shall guide you into all the truth, and he shall not speak for he shall not speak at all for himself. But things that we shall hear, these shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take a mind and shall declare it unto you. And the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into all truth, but they couldn't bear these things yet. They weren't strong enough. Let's go to Luke 17, 20 and 21. And being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God cometh? When's it going to come? He answered, said to them, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. You can't see a boundary for it. Neither shall they say, lo, here or there, or lo, the kingdom of God is within you. See, it's, it's not a physical kingdom. Now, if they had understood Daniel 2, particularly verse 44, they had understood that the kingdom was to fill the whole earth. And so, they again, they weren't putting together the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets. And they should have been, should have understood this. But again, some of these things... When your thinking is, is not clear, you don't interpret the scriptures correctly. Summarize it now, and in the last number of years. Induction was applied to the incident where the mob came to take Jesus. Now, by induction, we put together the facts. We put together each piece of information, we put them together, and then we draw a conclusion from it. And with just strict induction, we will get a, the likelihood that we have the truth on the matter. But with the Bible, what we have is we have it's a universe of information about the salvation of man's soul. So we probably are getting everything God wants us to know. So that's the conclusion I draw. And we have all we need to know about this subject when we put all these passages together. We don't need to know anything else about this uh, for our salvation's sake. Any questions? So, induction applied to the incident came to take Jesus. That's what we looked at. Each passage in order given above gives additional information. We keep just adding one piece to another as to what occurred in the event. event. This shows how to apply induction to biblical interpretation or hermeneutics. We just keep applying more and more information, adding it together, seeing how it fits. None of these contradict one another. To be a contradiction, it would have to deny it. Now, it would be a contradiction if Mark says that uh, had said that uh, John cut off the servant of the high priest here, and then Matthew, uh, uh, John, uh, John said that. And another one of these passages says Peter did it. So what we got here is Peter was with Jesus. He was one of them was with Jesus. So there's no contradiction. When are, we, when are we logically evaluated, they're not contradicting each other in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Peter encountered a relative, a kinsman of Malchus, when, when he, he denied the Lord. So we see them coming together again in this context. Peter was, this, this expresses one of the reasons Peter was afraid because he cut that man's ear off and, uh, you know, he could have been charged with trying to kill him. And so this gives Peter more reason to be afraid than just some of the, the ideas that people have about Peter. He, uh, he could have been put on trial with Jesus because he took the sword and tried to cut the man's head off. I think he swung it to cut his head off. And then the guy ducked and it glanced off the side of his head. And it cut his ear off, his right ear. Now, occasion was also used with regard to the Apostle Paul being left, Peter, I'm sorry, being left-handed. And to the incorrect view of the kingdom by the disciples at this time, not just Peter, but the other disciples too, they had the wrong impression. They were ready to fight. 
Now then, this ends our study of induction, putting these facts together. Do you have any comments or questions? Anybody? No comments or questions? All right.